Uh, but uh, in, in particular, this weekend on the 15th, that's Saturday, from noon to midnight over in the uh, city, Auditor city union here, uh, they're holding a 12-hour-long uh, a LAN party uh, slash gaming party where everybody is invited to come bring your gaming rig if you've got it. They've got switches uh, to hook up and play various games. If you've got, they, they also said if you want, want it to, you can bring classic systems as long as you bring uh, a TV or monitor capable of displaying them. Uh, everything and everyone is welcome. Uh, and of course, they're there for 12 hours. You, you don't, if you don't want to stay the whole 12 hours, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but there are, uh, more details are available on their website here. Uh, yeah. Uh, what day was that again? This Saturday, uh, the 15th. Yeah. Where's it going to be held? Uh, the City Union. Okay. Uh, I, I, the room to be determined because they don't post that till the day of, probably. But big enough to hold. They, they said that they were supposed to get eight switches, 48 uh, nodes a switch. So uh, you can do the math there on how many they can support. Yeah. Would you be there? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, if, if, uh, if, uh, I, I offered, oh, well, I'd have to bring it down from Omaha, but I, I thought there, there should be a MAME cab there. So, yeah. Everyone, yeah. Everyone is welcome to come. Yep. All right. All right. That's OS2G. And uh, they're, they're looking for uh, people to participate in their group more fully. Uh, not just at one, one or, uh, or two events like this. So if you're interested in open source software, you want to install Linux and a partition or something like that, you can go ahead and join their group and they'll, they'll help you get started. Uh, and then you can help others get started as well. All right, so where we left it off on last Wednesday was loops. Uh, basically, we need a way to be able to repeat co a piece of code that you want to do this operation on this, you want, you want to compute uh, the grade of, uh, of a student, but you wa don't want to just do it for one student. You want to do it in every, uh, for every student in a roster. right? You want to repeat the same operations over and over again. Uh, or, or you want to repeat the same piece of code. You don't cut and paste that piece of code as many times as you want, because you might not know up front how many times you want it to execute. So you need a loop control structure, a, uh, a control structure that allows you to repeat a piece of code uh, as many times as you want until some condition is satisfied or no longer satisfied, depending on how you want to view it. Uh, a loop, again, has three basic elements. An initialization, basically you've got to have a starting point. A uh, continuation condition, you continue to execute this loop once more until this condition is no longer satisfied. Uh, and then finally, an increment or a, an update. You have to make progress towards that termination condition. You can't just have a loop go forever and ever and ever. If you do, you have an infinite loop. There are some instances in which you want an infinite loop, right? Think about uh, a, um, uh, they're called pull threads. Uh, think about an operating system. Or an operating system is sitting there in an infinite loop waiting for you to click a button or uh, to press a key. Likewise, a game. A game is sitting there in an infinite loop. All right, that's called a pull loop until something happens, uh, that you pull the trigger and then shoot, or uh, you move the character over. It's sitting there in an infinite loop uh, looking for input to handle. Uh, those are a little bit different, though. Those are handled by uh, graphical, uh, uh, graphical user interface engines or uh, gaming engines or stuff like that. Uh, we won't get into that until the very end in this course. Uh, instead, we'll focus on very simple loops. And the easiest, simplest loop to get into is the for loop. Uh, well, it's called a for loop. Why? A for loop uses the keyword, what do you think? For, exactly. All right, that's why it's called the for loop. All three elements that we just identified, the, uh, the, the initialization, the continuation, and the increment, are located on the same line. Right? So for example, for, here, this is just fake code right here. This is not real code. Initialization. Right? We have the initialization statement followed by a uh, excuse me, followed by a, uh, a semicolon. Right? Then we have a continuation condition, again, followed by a semicolon. And finally, the increment statement, followed by no semicolon. Uh, you might think that that's a little bit inconsistent, and I would agree with you, but that's how it's done for historical purposes. Uh, the first two are executable statements. Uh, or the first one is an executable statement, so it ends with a semicolon. But so is the third, but it doesn't end with a semicolon. It's just weird. You just have to deal with it. Uh, it's for historical reasons that it's done this way. Uh, the continuation condition, that's just a logical expression, like a condition. If this condition, then go ahead and continue the loop. 
right? And when we looked at uh, con uh, uh, conditionals, we didn't put uh, semicolons at the end of our conditionals, did we? Here, for a for loop, we do. Right? Uh, each each uh, iteration of a loop uh, it, uh, executes the loop body. Right? That is a block of code after the for uh, statement that is ex uh, executed. Right? It holds a bunch of code that you execute. Uh, so I'm just going to get into it with a uh, really simple example here. We're simply going to count to 10. We're going to start at 1, print it out. Then go on to 2, print it out. Go on to 3, print it out. All the way up until we print out 10. So I'm going to have to have what's called an index variable. And it's just i. Right? Again, single variable names are not good in general, but this is just an index variable. You could write out the word index if you wanted to, but i, j, and k are commonly used idioms in many programming languages to simply indicate a variable that you're going to use for a loop control structure. And that's exactly what I'm going to do here. I want to start, uh, the first statement is I'm going to, uh, to uh, initialize it. I'm going to initialize it to 1, because that's where I start. I want to count 1 to 10. So where do I start that loop? I start it at 1. While i is less than or equal to 10, continue the loop. There's my continuation condition. As long as the value stored in i is less than or equal to 10, you will go one more iteration. And then finally, my increment is going to be i is equal to i plus 1. Okay? I'm going to add 1 to the variable i. We'll look at several shortcuts here coming up. But that's our first basic for loop. Those are the three elements. Now I have an opening curly bracket and a closing curly bracket to bind it to the loop body. You have to actually do something in your loop. Printf, well, and here I'm just going to simply print it out. All right, there we go. All right, now let's see this code in action. Oops, over in REPL, I'll cut and paste it. Oops, I'll go ahead and, there we go. All right, and let's run it. And it runs 1 through 10, right? Again, it, it started at 1. Then it made this check, is i less than or equal to 10? It does that before the loop begins. So if I had initialized it to 100, is this loop going to execute? We start at 100, and I don't have enough fingers for it. But is that less than or equal to 10? Nope. So it ends up printing nothing. It was a do nothing loop. Let me go ahead and restore that back to 1. So while I, the value stored in i is less than 10, go ahead and execute this loop. Print it. At the end of the loop, that's when this, in, uh, this iteration occurs. At the end of the loop, it's 1 right now. So we've printed it out, 1. Uh, and then we add 1 to it. Now it has a value of 2. We go back up to the top of the loop. 2 is still less than or equal to 10. So we execute it again. We print it again. And then we add 1 to it. Now we're up to 3. We go 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. When we hit 10, what happens to the variable i? It becomes? Uh, well, it's still less than or equal to 10, right? So it executes and prints 10. Then what happens at the end of that loop? We increment it again to 11. Then we come back up here. Is 11 less than or equal to 10? Nope. So that's where the loop ends. And to prove it, let's go ahead and print out the value of, uh, that i has after the loop executes. What should this, ex uh, what should this print? It should print 11, right? The, the variable still exists because we declared it before the loop began, so it exists after the loop begin, uh, after the loop ends, and it has a value that got us out of that loop. Right? So that, there, that, there are a couple of things to note here. Uh, the above example prints the values one to ten, uh, incrementing the index, uh, the index. Or sometimes these are called counter variables because you're just simply counting 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we'll call it an index variable because we'll use them as index variables. Uh, variable by 1 each time. All right. The continuation, oops, the continuation condition is checked before the loop executes on iteration. Right. And the increment statement executes at the end of the loop. Right? So those are two subtle, uh, subtle things to understand with a for loop. That it's, it's making that continuation, should I continue? Right? It, it, that, that's a question you need to ask before you continue. Right? So it's a question that's asked before the loop executes. 
That iteration happens at the end of the loop. That's why it doesn't start out at 2. If that iteration, uh, i plus uh, equals 1, if we added 1 to 1 uh, before the loop executed, it would immediately receive a value of 2, and it would have printed 2, uh, starting out at 2 instead. Right? So it executes at the end of the loop. Uh, so uh, in the above example, example, we declared, we declared i uh, before the loop. Therefore, it existed after the loop as well. All right. Let me go ahead and, uh, and put that print statement here just to remind you that this prints 11 because it has the value 11 after it's done executing. Yeah? Oh, if, so if you declare a variable within the body, like here, int foo, right, I'm just going to do this really quick, uh, then it would only exist inside that loop. Uh, but I'm going to look at another way of looking at this, right? Uh, remember that this is uh, the scope of a variable. The scope of a variable is the section of code in which it exists or can be seen by the program. That's why we call it a scope, right? What is a scope? If you look through uh, like a telescope, right? you, uh, you have tunnel vision. You can only see a certain area. So if your program is the entire night sky and you look through a telescope, you only see part of your program. Uh, and that's the, ver that's the area where the variable lives. Outside of that scope, way over here, it, that variable does not exist. So with respect to that example there, I exists before and after. Its scope spans more than just the loop. Alternatively, you can limit the scope of a variable to the loop itself. Right? And to do that, I'm going to cut and paste the, uh, the example here. And I'm going to change it a little bit. Instead of putting that index variable at the top, I'm going to put int i is equal to 1 within the loop control structure itself in that initialization statement. Now what, what happens is, in, the, uh, in, uh, in, this example, in this example, the variable i does not exist after the loop is done executing. So it will not print 11. What, in fact, will it do? Let me go ahead and change that with a question mark. I don't know. Let's find out. I'm going to cut and paste this over into REPL. And again, now we're looking at the second version where I've declared a loop scoped index variable. It only exists for that loop. So if it doesn't exist afterwards, what can it print? In fact, it's not even a valid program anymore. If i only exists in the scope of this for loop, i, the variable i only exists in lines 6 through 8. The variable i does not exist over here in 9. Just as uh, I never declared a variable called woo. Right? There's no variable called woo. How can you print it out? That's not going to be a syntax error, because in C, you have to declare all of your variables before you use them. That's what's called a statically typed language. You have to declare a, a, a variable and you declare its type before you can use it. So this is no longer even a valid program. I does not exist after the loop is done executing. But you can have this. Right? So. What does it print? This is not even a print statement. This is a compiler error here. Right? i does not exist after it's done executing. Uh, in general, you should limit the scope of a variable as much as possible. Right? You do not want variables with large scope. In fact, if you take your telescope, and you expand it so that you're looking at the entire night sky. If you, uh, if you look at the entire program at once, those are called global variables because everybody can see them. Any piece of code can see that variable. If any, any piece of code can see that variable, any piece of code can change that variable. And if any piece of code can change that variable, you have chaos. Uh, now, uh, now this code that uh, person A wrote over here and this code that per person B wrote over here, uh, now they're, they're, they're changing the same variable. They're, it's completely unpredictable. Uh, and it, uh, it's a nightmare for testing. So you want to limit the scope of your variables as much as possible. So if given a choice between these two chunks of code here, the second one is better. Right? 
want, you'll want to limit your uh, index variables as much as possible. However, there is a, uh, a pitfall here. Uh, on CSE, the default C standard uh, is old uh, and, uh, 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 and does not allow you to do this. Right? It's because this was actually forbidden in C89 and prior. Uh, it was only added in C99, so about 18 years ago now, or 19 years ago now. Uh, however, is, uh, you can change the standard of C that you use when you compile. So uh, my suggestion is that you adopt this uh, style right here because it's more modern. Uh, in other programming languages, this is how you do it all the time uh, because you always want to limit the scope. Uh, but unfortunately, on CSE, you're going to have to use a special flag. To use more modern C, use the STD, oh no, sorry, STD equals uh, GNU99. There, use the, that flag. So for example, if I were to have to compile this on CSE, I would use GCC. What other flag should I always, always use, by the way? Wall, W wall, and STD equals GNU99. That's a, if, you're, if you're wondering about the technicalities there, GNU99 is GNU's extension. So there's a bunch of other POSIX stuff that, 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 that comes free with that. Uh, POSIX is Portable Operating System Interface. And the X is well. We need to we need to make it sound good, and it's posse doesn't sound good. We need to so let's go ahead and put in an X there, right? Yeah. So uh, the uh, one one of the philosophies is C, of C is don't change, because if you change, you break stuff, uh, and so the uh, the bare minimum of C is what you should be using is, is some people's philosophy. Uh, and you might be on a system that does not have uh, a, a GNU ex a POSIX compliant uh, extension compiler for it. Uh, you, you, uh, you might be on a, a severely reduced system where only ANSI C can be compiled to it, in which case you have to take out all these bell bells and whistles because you only have like 100K to work with or something, right? Uh, and uh, it, it's just a small chip that's in a, uh, it's in a handheld radio or something. Uh, and you have to write code for it. An embedded system has severely limited um, capabilities. You can't, you can't take the entire Linux operating system and compile it and throw it on a small little chip and expect to still have room left over to do anything. Right? So this is what I would suggest that you start using from now. Use both the, the wall flag and the STD GNU99. And later today, when I, uh, when I go home, I'm going to post on Piazza instructions on how to get this changed permanently. So that you can type one piece of code, and then all you have to do from then on is GCC, and that will be your default. All right? Yeah? Uh, the order of the flags, yes. In, with these two, no. Some, with some other orderings, like uh, the LM for the, the math library, that might be, order, uh, that might be uh, required. I don't know. Uh, I think you can. but. Uh, I, ge we, I generally uh, throw it in the last one as the last one. Okay. So again, later today, uh, when I, uh, later tonight, I will go ahead and uh, and put that up there. All right. So syntactic, syntactic, syntactic. I think that's correct. Sugar. All right. So what? It, uh, sugar is sweet, right? You, uh, you put sugar or, or herbs or spices or whatever in your food to make it taste better. We all love sugar, right? Programming languages are, have what's called syntactic sugar. Uh, there are certain operations that are sufficient. For example, we'll look at another loop control structure here, a while loop. You only need one control structure, right? You only need one loop control structure. You can take any while loop and rewrite it as a for loop and any for loop and rewrite it as a while loop. But it's, uh, it's a much more expressive language if you've got multiple ways of doing the same thing in slightly different contexts. And that's what we call syntactic sugar. We add things to a language to make it more you know, uh, tasteful, right? Uh, that uh, that it, it tastes better when we use it because we've got other uh, different ways of doing similar things. The first syntactic sugar that we're going to uh, look at are increment, uh, the, that C has what are called increment operators. So the motivation here is that writing, say, i is equal to i plus 1 
is common and somewhat long, right? I had to write, oh, one, two, three, four, five characters plus four spaces to get that. You could take away the spaces, but you still have to write uh, five characters to do that. So instead, uh, C offers common increment operators. Uh, many languages provide uh, shorter, uh, short, shorthand ways of performing, perf performing common operations. So for example, uh, let's see, uh, I, uh, you can add one to any variable using I++. Plus plus. This is called the postfix increment operator. Now let me go ahead and, oh, this is not going to the next line, so let me go ahead and, there we go, now it's going to the next line. Uh, you can add one to any variable using simply I++. Plus plus. Uh, so that takes us down from five characters down to two, uh, three characters. So it's a little bit of savings. But when, you, when that's such a common operation that you're doing, simply just adding one for a for loop, it becomes idiomatic. It becomes something that you, just without thinking, you type it because that's how it's done. Uh, and so they, they, they put in a shorthand, an abbreviation, basically, into the language so that you, uh, that you can have a shorthand way of doing it. Uh, it's just like regular old English, right? Where you have uh, you have many adjectives that uh, that are synonyms to each other. You have many uh, many words that mean the same thing, but you use them in different contexts uh, to to convey some other you know connotative meaning. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a, it's it's kind of like a pro. This is a, a language a programming languages kind of approach to that kind of thing. It's giving you more a, a more shorter expressive ways of doing something that's that's a common task. Well, if you can add one to any variable, you can also subtract one. Subtract one to, uh, from any variable using, what do you think? Minus, minus, minus exactly. Right? Uh, you can also add, subtract, multiply, and divide by a constant other than one. Oops, sorry, one. Uh, for example, let me scroll here. Uh, uh, for example, is this going to go? No, there we go. Uh, a plus equals ten. So this is this is a little bit different. This is called this. The technical name for this is a compound assignment operator. What it does is it adds ten to the variable a. Right? Now it's equivalent. You know, it's it's equivalent. I, I'm putting that in quotes there because it's not actually equivalent, but it's equivalent to writing. You know, this is syntactic sugar. It's not necessary for your diet, right? Uh, you can uh, you can get by without using something like this, but it's equivalent if you in, if instead you just wrote this, right? A is equal to a plus ten. Uh, I say that I, I put equivalent into quotes there because that not actually equivalent. This one, this uh, shortened compound assignment operator, that's one operator. This one is actually two operators. It's an addition and then an assignment. All three of these operators featured up here have different orders of precedence that I don't like to think about, that I don't want to have to remember, so I don't. Right? Prefer using this one if you've got something very simple. Prefer using simple code so that you don't have to remember uh, which one of these operations has a higher order of precedence, so I have to be careful. Well, because you, you, you can keep in your mind that, that uh, multiplication and division, that goes first. Uh, subtraction and uh, addition, that comes second. Assignment, that, that's definitely last because it would evaluate everything on the right-hand side before it assigns the value. Uh, but uh, 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 assignment versus a compound assignment, I have no idea. Right? Uh, I'd have to look that up. So I don't bother with that, and I just keep my code simple. Likewise, you can do something like a uh, minus equals, say, 5, just to show you that it works on uh, different values. Uh, this subtracts 5 from the uh, variable a. And again, it's equivalent to simply just saying a is equal to a minus 5. Uh, careful, though, this is not the same as if I just wrote a equals minus 5. <laughs> what does that mean? As assigning a negative 5 to it, right? Uh, because the white space doesn't matter. So if I've got a negation there and a space and a 5, that's still negative 5. So put the value negative 5 into a, giving me a completely different value. Right? 
You can also do it with multiplication. A times equals, say, 2. Uh, what does this do? It multiplies A by 2. What happens when we multiply something by 2? What do we call that? It doubles it, right? This doubles the value stored in A. Right? Oops. A. Uh, you can also go A divided by equals uh, 3. Right? This divides, that is integer division. Right? So if there was 11 stored in A, what would it be? Think about that for a second. Uh, the value in A by 3. So if there was 9 stored in A, 9 divided by 3, that's going to be 3, so 3 is placed back into variable A. What if it's 11? 11 divided by 3 is 3.666666, but what happens to that 0.666666? Truncation, chopped off, thrown away, leaving you with just 3. That's integer division right there. It's a different story if you had a double on the left-hand side. Uh, that would be end up probably being 3.66666. Right. That was your question? All right. All right. Oh, let's see. So let's do one other quick example here. Instead of pr uh, printing the numbers 1 to 10, print numbers 10, 20, 30, dot, 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 up to 100, one per at line. But instead of, of that, that, that long, hand, long form, let's go ahead and use uh, uh, the short, uh, what, we've, uh, what we've looked at so far. First of all, let's go ahead and declare a loop scoped uh, variable, int i. Right? That's only going to exist for the for loop itself. And if you're on CSE, you would have to, uh, to compile with that, S, uh, uh, that GNU99 standard. So if, uh, where should I start i? Should I start it at 0? If I want to print 10, 20, 30, 40, I could start it at 0, but then I would have to you know, print always one, uh, 10 larger, right? So where should I start? 10. Right. Well, i is less than or equal to 100. Or what's another way that you could, uh, here, strictly less than 100. Will this get the job done? It'll print 10. If we go up by 10s, it'll be print 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 90. Then when we hit 100, will 100 be strictly less than 100? Nope. So we exit the loop. I will need to make sure that I go up to and include 100. Now, you could get the same effect by going with a strictly less than and going one more. Right? This will include 100, but that's really awkward. Uh, that's telling me, well, I have to figure out, well, I, I, I haven't even written the rest of the loop yet, and I, I'd, have to figure, I'd have to read ahead to see what this actually does. Whereas if I wrote less than or equal to 100, I am signaling my clear intent that I am going up to and including 100 on this loop. I could write it i is equal to i plus 10, but what's another shorter way of doing that? i plus equals 10. And eventually, when you get into the habit of seeing that, uh, you'll start to use it because then it becomes second nature. It becomes an idiom. It's, some, it's something that you recognize. Uh, I've used that word now a couple times. Let's clarify what it means. What is an idiom in regular old English? Nobody watches Archer? Archer had a, uh, the, the animated TV series, had a, uh, they asked him, you don't even, because <laughs> he's kind of stupid, you don't even know what an idiom is. And he goes, yeah, I do. It's a colloquial metaphor. <laughs> and so that, that's an excellent definition. What is a colloquial metaphor? Give me an example. It's not raining anymore. It was, rain, uh, it was raining well, a week ago. right? It was raining what? Cats and dogs. Exactly. Well, if you say like, it technically becomes a simile. right? So don't do, say that. You want a met metaphor. So it is, raining cats and, uh, it is raining cats and dogs. Technicality. Uh, grammar technicality, though, not CS uh, programming technicality. An idiom is a, a metaphor that, uh, it, it's a, that does not have a literal interpretation. It wasn't literally falling cats and dogs out of the sky. Uh, instead, it was a metaphor for it was raining heavily. And you only know those things by either learning them or growing up with them as, uh, as, as, as part of your language. Every language has these things. Every language has a non-literal saying 
that, di that connotes some other uh, uh, you know, feeling or idea. Code is a language. Code ha also has its own idioms. And these are, idi these are ba uh, basic idioms. That instead of going i is equal to i plus 10, I would shorthand that as i plus equals 10. And it's understood that that's shorthand and that, that we know what that means. There are going to be idioms throughout your entire uh, programming career. And you just have to get used to them because they're, they're, the u they're, they're u how it's usually done in code. If I did this the long, for long form, everybody would still understand it. It would still have the same effect, but it would be non-idiomatic. It wouldn't look right to an experienced programmer. Right? And this is going to be printf, percent %d, and the line, and i. Right? Great. If we want to see that one in action, let's go ahead and put it here. And does it go 10 to 100? Yep, it does. Great. Uh, again, if I had gone strictly less than 100, what would it have gone up to? Only up to 90. At which point, when it hit 100, it, well, the variable no longer exists after the for loop here, but it would be uh, 100. 100 is not strictly less than uh, 100, so it would break out of that loop. OK? All right. There's another loop control structure called a, well, there are a couple of others, but we're only going to cover the other one, while loops. So while loops use a slightly different syntax. And the keyword, what do you think here? If a for loop uses a for, a while loop should use a while, exactly. Oops, and you got to spell it right. There we go. All right. Uh, but, the, but the difference is that the three elements are generally located on different lines. Right? So I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to give you a general uh, uh, while loop here. Uh, the initialization comes before the loop even begins. Right? Just like a, a for loop would have it embedded in the same line, but it would actually be executed before the for loop begins. i is initialized to 1 or 10, as in our examples, before the loop even starts. Uh, here, we're just uh, we're cutting out that middleman, and we're, 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 we're putting our initialization before we even have the loop structure. Then we have the keyword while, right? opening and closing curly brackets. Within those parentheses there, that's where our continuation condition is placed. While this condition continues to evaluate to true, execute the loop at least once mo one more time. And of course, we have to make uh, progress towards that, uh, that, ter that the, the termination condition, the opposite of the continuation condition. So our increment will be at the end of the loop. Right? This, is, this, this is the same basic behavior as a for loop, but it's slightly different syntax. And we'll get into why you would want, uh, want multiple uh, loop structures in a moment here beyond just the syntactic sugar. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, rewrite our one, counting 1 to 10 loop as a while loop. So int i is equal to 1. Right? There we go. Come on. There we go. Then I'll have my while loop. While i is less than or equal to 10, continue printing it out. Printf, percent %d, and the line. i. There we go. And I've got too many quotes. There we go. All right. There we go. Uh, and what am I missing here? I'm missing my, uh, I, I've got the, continu the, uh, the initialization, the continuation. I have to make progress towards breaking out of there. So what do I need? Increment. i is equal to i plus 1. Or now that we've learned some different syntax, what else could I do? i plus plus. So those three elements are in three different, compl uh, th completely different lines here. Right? Let's see this one in action. So again, it should print 1 to 10, and it does. But there are the, the, because those three things are located on different lines, we've got a little bit more flexibility that we can work with. That flexibility can be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. That flexibility would allow me to say, do the increment before the actual print statement. What would happen here? Let's walk through this loop before I execute it. i is 1. i is less than or equal to 10. So we go on to line 8, and I increment it to 
two before I even print it. I then print it. So where does the print start? It starts at two, then three, then four, dot, dot, dot. What's the last one that will get executed? 11? Why? I will be 10. 10 is less than or equal to 11, uh, 10. So we execute. what, And then on line 8, it increments to what? 11. And then that gets printed. So our prediction here is that it's going to run from 2 up to 11. And it does. We're off by 1. We wanted to print 1 to 10. But that's not what we got here because we did something di slightly different. We incremented before the loop, uh, or at the start of the loop, instead of the end, at the end of the loop. So you've got to be careful there on those subtle differences. A while loop allows you to, this flexibility, but the flexibility can give you results that you don't want. All right? So be careful. All right. All right. Go back to here. All right. All right. So again, a while loop loop allows a little more flexibility because the uh, uh, increment operation can be done at any point within the loop body. Right? So, but you have to be careful. Or you may be off by one. Those are, that's a very common error that we'll revisit here in a second. Right? But we were off by one because instead of printing one to 10, we were printing two to 11. So we were off by one the entire time. So here's a non-trivial fact. Any for loop can be rewritten as a while loop and vice versa. All right. So the question is, why do we have two loop structures? And when do we use each one? Right. So again, the one reason that we have two different loop tr control structures is because the first bullet point there, uh, it, uh, the while loop allows a little bit more flexibility. If you want to have that, uh, that increment at the beginning of the loop for whatever reason, you can do that. You can't really do that in a for loop because a for loop always executes that increment statement at the end of the loop. Uh, you could rewrite it so that you're manually doing the increment inside the for loop if you really wanted to. Uh, so that's not really an argument one way or another. Uh, but uh, again, syntactic sugar. We like having multiple ways of doing the same thing. I can, uh, I can take one, rewrite it as another, or vice versa, but it feels more natural in some instances to use one loop over another loop, and I'll tell you why here in a second. Yeah? You'd leave it blank, but you'd still have all of your uh, semicolons there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are, there are things called do while loops. That's the third loop, the structure that I'm leaving out. Uh, I, I won't cover that. It's, it's different syntax. It's completely different behavior. Uh, and the use cases for it are the extreme minority. So for loops, while loops, we're good enough. I, I'm, cutting, I'm cutting our sugar diet in, in half, uh, by one third. Right. Yeah? Nope. So maybe it's less flexible. <laughs> yeah? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Is it for do loops that are not compatible with C? No, do, they, uh, C does have do while loops. Uh, but I, I generally omit them from coverage. If you want to use them, go ahead. The, the textbook covers them. I believe even uh, one of the videos covers the, uh, the, of mine covers them. Uh, there's, uh, there's less reason to use them when you've got for loops and while loops. Uh, the, the, again, the only difference is that a do while loop is uh, executed unconditionally at least once. Uh, the while condition is always checked at the end of the loop instead of the beginning of the loop. And then you have to put a semicolon at the end of the condition, which is departs from everything else. So that's why I don't like uh, covering it, because it, it's so different. And it's not, as uh, it's not as useful when you have these two nice loops uh, anyway. Another question? Or no? OK. Good. All right, so if we limit our scope, or if we limit our discussion to only for loops and while loops, when do you use them? In general, I'm not going to say that these are rules because they're not rules that you have to follow, but in general, you use for loops when you know, when, when you know up front 
a fancy word for this is a priori uh, at the beginning, bef before you begin, uh, or whatever, bef before priori, whatever Latin it, that means. Uh, up front, how many iterations you will execute. Right? For example, the for loop that we just did, counting 1 to 10. I know up front that I want to uh, execute this 10 times. A for loop seems more natural to do that. When you don't know up front how many times to execute, that's when you probably want to bring in a, for, a while loop. In general, if you do not know how many times the loop will execute, that is, it's based on some complex logic, then you generally use a while loop. Right? And again, it's just kind of personal preference. Uh, it, 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 it's going to have to be a feeling that you get when, uh, like, iterating over a, an array, uh, definitely that's probably going to be a for loop. Uh, but if you don't know, and we'll look at some examples when we look at exercises, some exercises here, but uh, when, you, when you know up front, yes, this is going to run 1 to 10, or 1 to 100, or 1 to n in general, if n is a variable, then a for loop is most appropriate there. Uh, if you don't know, uh, th this might run 5 times, it might run 10 times, it might run 3 times. It all depends on the input. That's probably an indication that you want a while loop. Okay. And again, we'll have several examples here. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, in fact, uh, so you hear, uh, let's just do an example here. Uh, for example, uh, the for uh, the uh, uh, the counting uh, counting one to ten or one to n. Uh, Let's see if math mode works here. Does that work? Yeah, nice, nice little fancy n there. Uh, generally, a for loop is appropriate. Appropriate. There we go. All right. Example: If we want to count the number of digits in a number, then we don't know we we don't know how many iter how many iterations. Uh, it will execute because that's what we're trying to compute. So, for example, let me just go ahead and copy and paste an example here. Uh, suppose that I've got a number n, and our goal here is compute the number of digits in n. In in, in this in this particular case, how many digits are there? It looks like there's nine, right? If n is a variable that's not hard coded here, we don't know that up front. It could have Three uh, digits. It could have ten digits. It could have, well, it couldn't have uh, more than uh, two point four uh, one four. So it couldn't have more than ten digits. Otherwise, you'd have overflow. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to write a very simple loop here to count the number of digits. Now you have an easy, e easier solution. You all witnessed it in your first assignment. In fact, it was a bug that Gomer put in there, right? How do you how do you determine the number of digits in a number? Log, right? Log base 10 uh, tells you plus minus 1 uh, how many digits are, uh, are in a number base 10. Uh, just like if I had log base e or log base 2, that would tell me how many bits there are in a, in a number. Right? Uh, that's what a log does. Uh, a log tells you how many digits there are because a log is x to the, uh, or 10 to the x, well, that's the x that you're trying to find. Right? So if I have a number uh, that, uh, that is, Say one billion. How many zeros are in one billion? Well, it's whatever th this number on the exponent is, right? So there is a one-line solution to this. I want to look at the loop solution. So the idea is continue to divide or divide uh, n by ten until it is zero. Right? Let's take this idea really quick on a on a you know piece of paper or on the back of our hand. Let's just take 324. Uh, I want to get an answer of 3. So if I divide 324 uh, by 10, what do I get? Uh, here's my counter over here. It starts at 0. Divide 324 by 10. And you get 32. Remember, truncation, that 0.4 goes away. Increment my counter, 1 here. Now I've got 32. Divide it by 10 again. What do I have now? 3. Increment your counter. Divide 3 by 10, and what do you get? 0 with truncation. Increment your counter. At this point, I've got 3 in my counter, which tells me how many, uh, how many uh, uh, digits there were in that number. 
So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to uh, continually divide by n until it's 0, keeping track of a counter. All right? Does it seem natural to use a for loop here? And let me ret uh, return the number here. Does it seem natural to use a for loop here? A for loop would run an index variable from 1 up to n, where n is some number. What, what is n here? n is the number of digits that I'm trying to calculate. I don't know. If I knew n up front, then I wouldn't have to write a loop for this. So a while loop is a little bit more appropriate. While something, continue to divide it by 10. So divide n by 10. How do I do that? I could go n divided, uh, is equal to n divided by 10, except for what, uh, what, what's the shorthand that I could now use? n divided equals 10, right? And increment your counter. So count plus plus. Or I could have gone count is equal to count plus 1. Again, shorthand. Get used to using those shorthands, and you'll type a lot less. Let me go ahead and create int counter is equal to 0. Or count, counter, counter. Yeah, let's go with counter. All right. Now, what's my condition here? While what? When do I stop? When n is 0. So I continue when n is not 0. So n is greater than or equal to 0. All right. This will work. And let's go ahead and print f number of digits in n, percent d, and the line, uh, and counter. Right. Let's go ahead and see this in action on REPL. So we should expect uh, 9 because I've set n here to be 2.3. Uh, no, wait, what have I set it to? 234 million. So it should be 9, right? Three, four, five, six. Uh-oh. What's wrong? What do you think is wrong? Set it, uh, I, have I set it to zero? It didn't print anything, right? But is it still running? I don't know. Is it? I don't know. How, how can you tell? What's going on here? Um, what happened to my play button? Well, yeah, but what? What? what, what it's. It, I heard it. What? It's an. In, in, it's an, an infinite loop right now, right? There's that stop button. It's still playing. So stop. There we go. Right? Stopping. Uh, there we go. I don't. Uh, I don't see what the immediate problem is, so let me go ahead and go to the command line here. Foo.c. Yeah. OK, well, here. Let, let, let me just confirm that we are, in fact, in an infinite loop. So I'm going to go to the command line here and run it. Looks like it's in an infinite loop to me. I want to show you that, though. You will get caught eventually in an infinite loop. If you're on the command line, how do you? Well, if with REPL, it had this little nice stop button, right? Play, stop. That's obvious. When you're at the command line, it's not so obvious. How do I, how do I kill this program? Control C. That's what that caret is. Control C will kill the current running program. You can do, if you've got an IDE, uh, like a code blocks or something, I'm sure that they've got a play button and a stop button that you can stop a program from be, uh, that's caught in an infinite loop. If you're at the command line, it's just simply Control C. That's for, uh, for Windows, Mac, everything. If you're on the grader and you've got an infinite loop, uh, there's no stop in it. There's no stop button on the grader. After about five minutes, it'll kill it automatically. Uh, and so you can close your browser and restart. Please, though, do some more testing before you resubmit it, because you don't know why, what, it, what's, what it's printing out. You don't know what it's doing on the grader. Uh, you, that's why it's important to test your stuff. Okay. So is this stopped? I, I do want to go on the REPL here, though. All right, let's walk through this. In fact, let's walk through this with that same example that I did, 234, so that it's small. Uh, I don't know if that was the same one. 234. 
here's a poor man's way of, of deciding, uh, determining what's going on here. I'm going to add a print statement. n is now percent %d and the line, and n. I'm going to add a print statement to print, well, what values of n are, is it doing here? It's clearly divided by 10, so I should expect it to be 234, 23, 2, and then 0. And let's see what it does. OK. Well, that <laughs> REPL is not uh, uh, cooperating with me there. So let's go ahead and do it over here instead. Printf uh, n is now percent %d and the line n. Save that and run it. Oh, it's printing 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 over and over and over again. Let's kill it. Let's go back to the drawing board. Can I stop? All right. Stop, 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 stop. All right. Oh, well. Stop button. Uh, page became unresponsive. Exit page. OK. We might come back to REPL there. So what was the issue? Yeah. Yeah, look at that condition. While uh, n is greater than or equal to 0, it's 0. So 0 divided by 10 is what? 0. 0 divided by 10 is what? 0, 0, 0, 0, right? So it was in my condition. Right? I, uh, I was off on my condition here. What should it have been? Greater than or, well, if it, the equals is what killed it, right? It's, uh, it, once it hits 0, I no longer want to continue executing. Let's see if that fixed it. There. It goes down, 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 and 9. I should probably still also test this for other values, right? Does it work for a three-digit number? Yep, it works for a three-digit number. Oops. Does it work for a single-digit number? Yeah, it works for a single-digit number. What are some other edge cases, corner cases, that I should probably be thinking about in testing? Negative values. Negative 232. Uh, two. You should expect 3 here, right? What's going to happen? What do you think? So not an infinite loop, but it gives me the wrong value, right? I wonder why. I'll leave that as a, uh, an, an exercise for you, OK? I think the video covers it, so if you want the answer, go ahead and, spoilers, go ahead and read the uh, watch the video. What's another corner case? Corner cases, edge cases, those are, uh, the, the, uh, those are values that approach the uh, limits of normal operating procedures and then values that exceed normal operating procedures. Uh, generally, if you've got like a motor or something, and it's uh, it's designed to run efficient uh, at 90% efficiency uh, between the temperatures zero and 300 degrees Fahrenheit or something, then the way that you test it on uh, the edge cases or the corner cases is you put it in a room that's 295 degrees, and then you try to uh, overstress it, and you put it in a room that's 310 degrees or something like that. Right? Does it fail? Uh, does it act as designed? And so code is just like that. You stress test it. You look at uh, edge cases, corner case values. What would another one be? Yeah. Oh. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. All right. Uh, compiler's caught that. Awesome. Right? Why? Three, bill three billion is more than 2.147 billion. So the, 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 it's already giving me more. And, uh, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up being a negative number. Are you sure that that's what you wanted? Good. Night, good, good compiler. Right. Give it a treat. Yeah. Zero. All right. I like that. Let's run it. What's your prediction? Oh, oh OK. It definitely executes, but it does that, is that the right answer? The loop didn't execute because n was 0, n is not less than or equal to, or less, uh, strictly less than 0, or greater than 0. So the loop never executed. My co counter still had a value of 0, but there's one digit in 0. So this is an edge case or a corner case that we probably have to take care of separately. Right? This is beyond normal operating procedures. If n is equal to 0, then we'll pr print f 
uh, there is one digit in zero. Right. And the line, whatever. Else, and then put everything else inside of that, like something like this. Then come back and fix it, <laughs> because it's, it's poor formatting. There, there's definitely two points off for the poor formatting there. Because right? I'm, not, I'm not indenting. Right? I'm th this else statement, everything in here should be indented. Right? All right, good. Good software testing so far. Right. So, good, 20 minutes left. Let's look at some more pitfalls. Right. There's the, of course, the uh, aforementioned off by one errors. All right. So for this, I'm simply going to look at some other uh, code here. I love this code uh, because it, uh, it has failure written all over it. Uh, I just have to find it, sorry. Uh, lectures, uh, let's see, loops, there we go. This is from an old slide set that I have. Here we go, all right, so, all right, I'll zoom in here. Anybody, and I wish I'd brought it, if, I, if I'd remembered I would have brought my Zoom, it's still in my uh, office here. Uh, anybody remember what a Zoom was? We can look it up. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was Microsoft's answer to the iPod. Here's what it looked like. It was uh, slightly bigger, slightly heavier, much cheaper, uh, and uh, and it also had a radio in it. So uh, that's why I liked it because you could still at least uh, pull the uh, radio st AM radio stations and listen to the games. Uh, you could not do that on an iPod. You still can't do that on an iPod. Do they still make iPod iPod Nanos? Right? They still make those. Uh, but the large ones, the iPod videos, oh, you got a Zune with you? No. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, nobody has a Zune with them. All right. So, on December 31st, 2008, 2008 was a leap year. Everybody's Zunes froze up for 24 hours, exactly 24 hours. On, uh, on January 1st, 2009, they suddenly started working again. Why? Uh, an embedded module in the Zune contained the following actual code. This, uh, they, they, they did a, uh, not a, it's not called a retrospective, it's called a uh, uh, postmortem, right? Like they do for an autopsy. Uh, what, what went wrong? So they have a postmortem uh, for it. And they published this code. Uh, this code, uh, similar to what you did in uh, lab three for leap years, it was trying to determine if it was a leap year or not. And if it was a leap year, they were going to do something different. While days, well, it was a leap year and the last day of a leap year. So what was day? What, what day was it? It was the 366th day. So days had a value of 366, which was strictly greater than 365. So we go into this loop. If is leap year, year, year was 2008, which was a leap year. So this evaluated to true. So we go into that condition. This condition down here, the, because they're mutually exclusive, that was never executed. If days is strictly greater than 366, what was it again? 366. 366 is strictly greater than 366? No. So what happens? Goes back all the way to the top and repeats the same process. 366 in days was not changed. So it's still greater, it's still a leap year, and it's still not strictly greater than. So go back up to the top, right? And so for 24 hours, this loop happened, right? And that's all it was doing. It wouldn't, it wouldn't start up. It was just doing this loop. What's the fix? Equals, right? Three, uh, on line five, uh, greater than or equal to 366, uh, then it would subtract 366 from it, reset it down to the zeroth day, and then, uh, then add one to the year, making it 2009. And it worked on December or on January 1st, 2009, because that would have been the 367th day, in which case the line five would have then worked. Right? Uh, what was the, the real failure here was not testing. If you've got a corner case, an edge case that handles leap years differently, you'd better best test that, that uh, uh, simulate it. Simulate uh, December 31st, 2009, and see what happens. Right? Not that it was that big of a deal. It wasn't a mission critical system, uh, and it wasn't a big seller, so not a, not a lot of people had Zunes. They were just denied 
they're MP3s for 24 hours. So not that big of a deal overall, but think about the man hours that Microsoft had to put into this to find the bug, to come up with a solution, very easy solution, one, one character solution, but recompile everything, push it all out, make a report, do a post-mortem. Think of how many man hours were wasted uh, fixing this stupid trivial bug, when if they had just made one test, they could have gotten away with it. Right? And I think I've got some other things in here, other examples. These are, these are kind of old, uh, but uh, they're, they're still relevant today. Uh, September 30th, 1999, $125 million Mars orbiter crashes, careens into the surface of Mars. Uh, may, maybe many of you were not alive at the time, but maybe you've heard about it. What happened? Uh, one, one subsystem inexplicably was doing things in English, uh, English uh, uh, units, miles per hour. In no scientific application, no legitimate scientific application do you do that. But one subsystem was speaking in metric. Uh, every, everything else was speaking in metric. This one subsystem was speaking in English units. So when, they thought, when it thought it was going you know, 100 miles per hour, uh, it was instead going 200 miles per hour. And instead of landing soft, uh, relatively softly, it instead was you know, going like a jet engine down to the surface and, and destroyed. Right? Uh, there was another Mars orbiter that, that, did the, uh, that had another failure around that time, but it was a little bit different bug. Uh, but, you know, these bugs should, uh, are, are stupid bugs that should have been detected that ultimately cost $125 million in damages, right? Uh, there are other bugs throughout history that could have cost everybody on the planet their lives. Uh, there's the Stanislav Petrov was a, uh, in the, the height of the Cold War in 1983. Uh, uh, this might be an apocryphal story, but you can read up on it and all the details. Um, the, the details are, are murky since it was so old and uh, only de declassified many years later. Uh, but there was a new system that was telling him that the American that just went online. He knew that it had a bunch of bugs. It was a new system. He probably shouldn't trust it, even though he had standing orders that if it tells you that the Americans are launching missiles, you should do the same. Uh, well, they turn it on and immediately it says the Americans are launching missiles. <laughs> Uh, and it was, the, it was a software bug that I, I think that this, it was not necessarily a bug, but it was a configuration setting uh, that was uh, interpreting either cosmic ray reflections off of clouds as missile launches. Uh, and of course, you know, they were not missile launches, uh, but uh, if he had followed his standing orders, he would have launched his missiles, and of course the Americans would have done the same, then everybody else would have launched their missiles, leading to a uh, nuclear disaster. Instead, he was smart about it. It's probably a bug. I'm not going to launch my missiles. Uh, and there's a whole uh, history of uh, worse software bugs. That was as of 2005. Every day, uh, you, go, you, you can't go without hearing a news story about some software bug. The latest that I heard was uh, uh, that uh, uh, some software glitch at uh, Wells Fargo was denying a bunch of people loan refinancing, costing them their homes. Right. Uh, so imagine uh, being in charge of a mission critical system that's costing people their lives or livelihood and being off by one and now somebody loses their home because of it. You don't have to worry about that in this class, but eventually that's a concern that you should have, which is why you should get into good habits now. Even if, it, if the small habits of having good styling, doing a lot of software testing, testing those edge cases, those corner cases. Yeah. Well, uh, the history that I've read is that it was uh, uh, in the lexicon, engineering lexicon before that. Uh, engineers would, would call defects bugs. Uh, but it became popularized by, uh, I forget her name now. Darn it. Anybody help me? Uh, it's uh, the, the, the what, sorry? No, not Margaret Hamilton. She's the first software engineer. She, uh, the, the, the Navy, I think she was lieutenant, uh, that, that w was working on uh, software in the 50s before Margaret Hamilton. Um, uh, not Anita Borg. <laughs> now, damn it, I can't think of it. It's uh, her conference, is, the conference is named after it. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, darn it, I forget. Uh, if anybody, yeah, you got it? Grace Hopper, thank you, the Grace Hopper con uh, concert. Uh, she popularized the term in computer science because 
she was working on a mainframe uh, back when mainframes used uh, vacuum tubes. So uh, vacuum tubes, uh, high pressure, low pressure were your zeros and ones. And they were these giant tubes. Uh, and uh, they're, they're, it wasn't working because one of the vacuum tubes had a moth in it. So she took it out, put it in her notebook, and said, ha ha, the uh, software bug. Right? Uh, it was a literal bug that she pulled out of the system to get it to work. And so she popularized the term in, uh, in software engineering and in software development. Uh, but I think that uh, it was a, ter a term of art used in uh, uh, engineering prior to that. Right? Uh, but th we do call them bugs today. In fact, there are people that, th that say that you should not call them bugs because bugs absolves you of the responsibility. Oh, it's just a bug. It's, it's, something, it's, it's, it's something that you can't control that comes in out, of, uh, out and then bites you, right? Uh, and it, it's not something I can control unless I go out and spray a bunch of insecticide. And it's not. It's, uh, it, it's human-made, right? It's a human-made defect, a human-made error. Uh, and so uh, there are some people that say you shouldn't call them bugs. You should call them what they are because it kind of uh, separates the, the developer from the responsibility that they have to ensure de uh, defect-free software, right? Yeah, everybody calls it. Nobody's going to change what they call it. <laughs> I'm not going to change what I call it. Uh, but keep that in mind that they're, even though they're bugs, they're still your responsibility, right? So that classic Zune bug, right? that uh, be sure that your uh, loops begin and end where you want them to. All right. Uh, all right. I'll, let, let's do a, a couple more uh, uh, pitfalls here. Uh, one would be, of course, be, of course, be infinite loops. Uh, I, I demonstrated this before. If I want to go from 0 up to 9, uh, what will this do? What will this piece of code do? It'll keep going, printing what? 0. Print 0, print 0, print 0, print 0, because I'm not making a progress towards my termination condition. So it results in an infinite loop uh, to kill a program from the command line. Use control C. Uh, so that's an infinite loop. You also have missing brackets. So consider the following piece of code here as our last piece of code for the day. Or missing, missing, there we go. Missing G, too. All right. What does this do? Everything looks fine. Let's test it out. Let's go to his uh, REPL. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go away. Go away. There we go. Let's find out what happens. Zero is printing zero over and over again. Why? Yeah, I, what did I forget? I forget my curly brackets. Opening curly bracket, closing curly bracket. So what ends up happening here, hopefully I can stop it. Otherwise, that's OK if it gets caught. All right, come on. All right, I'll go over here and highlight it. What happens without curly brackets is that your control structures, just like the if statements, will only bind to the next executable statement. So this while loop, without its curly brackets, only binds to the print statement. So 0, print 0, goes back. 0, print 0, print 0, print 0, print 0. That I++ is not part of the loop. Even though I've done good style and I've indented it at the same level, because I don't have those opening and closing curly brackets, it's not treated as the same block of code. So it only binds to the next executable statement. So in general, oops, sorry, undo that. In general, always have your curly brackets, even if you don't, even if you don't need them. Right? Uh, it's just best practice. Get into the habit of always putting the curly brackets there, and you won't run into this issue. Uh, it results in an infinite loop because the loop only binds to the print statement, not the increment. Right? So always, always, as a general rule, put uh, curly brackets there. It's a stylistic thing. 
If you forget your uh, curly brackets, then you start to get into uh, bad habits where you'll use them here and then you won't use them here and it'll be fine until you get to a situation like this where uh, you didn't end up using them because you didn't get into the habit of it, but you ended up, you did need to use them. So uh, adopt good uh, sty uh, styling up front and always follow it, uh, even if you don't need to technically to, uh, in, in some instances. Okay. All right, any questions? Otherwise, that's where we'll continue on Wednesday.